Hey everybody, this is Rain Canope and Ben Bowman. Welcome to the Oregon Bridge. I've come to believe that a deep separation in our underlying political life is simply whether people have had good or bad experiences with government, whether they sort of instinctually trust or mistrust the state. There are rural counties all across the country that have unrecognizably low levels of government. Oregon's work products industry and a lot of the jobs connected to timber harvest were low income working class jobs for most of Oregon's history. All right, folks, uh, today uh, our guest is Professor Michelle Wild Anderson, a law professor at Stanford University School of Law, to talk about her brand new book, The Fight to Save the Town, Reimagining Discarded America. Uh, first of all, I'm going to read a little bit about her bio, but I'm just going to start by saying I highly recommend the book. Um, I really enjoyed it. I got emotional reading it. I learned a lot about a part of this state that I thought I knew something about that I think I was wrong about several things, um, which we talk about in the episode. Um, but it's all about Josephine County in the podcast today. The book covers areas beyond Josephine County. It talks about Stockton, California, um, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and Detroit, Michigan, in addition to Josephine, talking about um, places where there's high amounts of poverty and where the governments are broke. That's the basic topic, as, as we'll discuss. But um, a little bit about Professor Anderson. Um, she, as I mentioned, is a, a law professor. Uh, she was awarded the Early Career Scholars Medal in 2019. Her academic writing combines legal analysis and humanistic reporting to understand and improve city and county governance of low-income urban and rural places. She's done place-based work focused on the water and infrastructure needs of high poverty, rural communities in the South and Southwest, rural land use challenges in California's San Joaquin Valley, school reform in Memphis, Tennessee, public bankruptcy, insolvency in Detroit, Stockton, and Puerto Rico, local fiscal crises, and state interventions in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Oregon, and Rhode Island, and poverty in Oregon's rural timber counties. Her national research has focused on the legal tools designed to help city and county governments that are facing high levels of poverty as well as budget crises. So um, that's a little bit about Professor Anderson's work. Um, Reagan, what did you think of our conversation? One of the things I really appreciate about Michelle, and she's super smart, uh, first off, is that she doesn't paint, uh, you know, conservative communities, especially we talked about Josephine, with that broad brush, she talks about a lot of the reasons and really does actually validate a lot of their experience and the challenges that they face um, as a community. She really gets into kind of um, the different kind of factions that are there. And so it's not all just, oh, you know, Republicans don't like taxes. It's she really gets into the details. And so I appreciated that. I, I learned a ton also. I lived in Medford for a while and drove through and visited people in Grants Pass in Josephine County um, quite a bit. And so um, I thought I knew about Josephine, but you're right. She, you know, her research and, and her um, writing really brought a whole new level um, of of understanding for me. So in this episode, we're going to talk about uh, timber, natural resource economy, but in the context of how it led to the state of Josephine County today, we're going to talk about what it actually means for people when government services get removed and which government services we're talking about. Uh, we talk about law enforcement and the very wild and unsafe situation in a lot of parts of Josephine County and the ways in which community has come together to try to fill that need. Um, we talk about local levies, we talk about the caliber of people running for office, the, where state government um, can step in. This might be our longest podcast episode ever because we just, I could not stop. We could not stop. Um, we could have talked for another uh, two or three hours probably. But um, I think with that, let's just jump into the episode. Um, thank you everyone for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, we hope you enjoy this week's episode with Professor Michelle Wild Anderson. All right, uh, Professor Michelle Wild Anderson, thank you so much for joining the podcast. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. I'm so glad to be here. I have been very excited to uh, talk to you. I have a copy of your book here. I've got a couple of <laughs> postmark pages we'll talk about. Um, you were a recommendation by a friend of the podcast, Marshall Kozloff, who's the host of the Realignment Podcast. And uh, he recommended you because 
you know, your, your, your book, it's called the fight to save the town. We'll talk all about it, but you picked four cities. Uh, and in the case of Josephine County, a County, a regional area in Oregon to study, to talk about poverty, not in the context of, uh, dying cities, but of sort of the challenges and opportunities of, um, poverty stricken places in this country. So before we dive into Josephine County, can you describe how you landed on the four locations and particularly Josephine County, how that ended up on the list? Oh, sure. I mean, I'll give the quickest definition that the book is about places that are poor, but also broke. And the way that being broke makes it um, harder for people to get out of poverty. And that um, when places have high levels of local poverty, it makes it more likely that their governments are broke. So sort of the relationship between those two things and the way that when you let that poor and broke dynamic sit around for 10, 20, 40 years, it gets harder to fix it. So that's the you know, biggest picture of the, the project. And the four places that I chose are really different from each other. And I did that on purpose because the problem of poor and broke places is, um, is really a national problem. And it's uh, governments that run from super rural to super urban and small towns uh, and inner ring suburbs in between. It runs from politically conservative to politically liberal to purple in between. Um, and it shows up in all kinds of different racial compositions. So mm -hmm. this is not a, an all white problem. It's not an all black problem. It's not an all Latino problem. Um, and you can find uh, this problem of citywide poverty and um, in places that are some of the most diverse places in the country. So I wanted on purpose to hold these different environments so we could kind of think about this as a problem that you can't kind of write off as one group's problem. Um, Josephine in particular came on my radar because Paul Diller, who's a terrific professor at Willamette Law School and a, um, a really important scholar of local government law, brought a bunch of folks together from around the country to talk about the fiscal problems in the timber counties. So it wasn't mm -hmm. just Josephine, it was obviously Eastern Oregon, Southern Oregon, you know, the larger swath of counties in Oregon outside of the Willamette Valley that were really looking for kind of a foothold in the modern economy and um, had lost this kind of timber industry anchor for their local economy. Um, and, uh, and that conversation was amazing. And first of all, it sort of opened up this whole um, exploration for me of timber and of the Pacific Northwest and really sort of falling in love with Oregon in a way. Um, and I learned a lot about Josephine in the process of that. And then I ended up kind of dropping down more and more deeply into the county through the process of writing the book. Okay, very cool. That makes sense. Um, so I want to start the conversation with you write about Josephine County in a really beautiful and funny and interesting way. So there's a couple, I want to start by like, a lot of our podcast listeners are like me. They're Portland metro area or Willamette Valley area. And Josephine County is like essentially California to them. It's a different place. Um, so I want to give an overview. Oh, so not of California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although, yeah, there's the there's the the story about Trinity County. What was it that happened in Trinity County? It was also some like wild and I don't want to say lawless stuff, but kind of. Yeah, I mean, I can tell that story. I mean, that is so Northern California, the far, you know, hours of driving of Northern California, it's a giant territory, um, have a lot of the same um, uh, big rural governments that have very weak funding um, bases. And so Northern California and Southern Oregon actually do have a lot politically mm -hmm. in common. Um, and the story that I tell from Trinity County has to do with a sheriff's office that um, doesn't have anybody available to dispatch to a murder that's taking place yes. and calls in some neighbors to oh, yeah. check on a 911 call that has come in and sort of an elderly couple walks over to their next door neighbor's house and, and, um, a grisly uh, series of attempted homicides of them take place. And it's a larger thing anyway. And the, the legal question at the base of that Trinity County lawsuit is whether we have a right to police and dispatch. Um, and so uh, for reasons I'm sure we'll come back to, it connects to the larger ratcheting of public services that we saw in Josephine. And the, and the spoiler alert from that Supreme Court case is the Supreme Court says, no, you do not have a right to law enforcement protecting you, basically, right? 
Yeah, I mean, the truth is that that lawsuit in Trinity is a, is a kind of idiosyncratic thing about whether that couple became covered by workers' comp when the sheriff asked them to go next door. And so the California court was kind of taking on this wonky question of whether you become a delegate of the state when a sheriff asks you to do the bidding of the government. And so it ends up being a kind of niche question about the allocation of responsibility and more importantly, how this poor couple that got, you know, mm. stabbed within inches of their life, um, you know, will be compensated by Trinity for this terrible series of events. And, but nonetheless, it's stamped the big picture case law that I described. This is not even a very, long <laughs> we're giving what? a kind of distorted idea of what this book is about, but there are a couple of interesting byways in terms of the law and the punchline of all of this line of law is no we do not have a right to anything from our local governments except k-12 so i which, mean which is wild <laughs> right. it is i think we take it for granted because our politics deliver lots of things almost all the time they deliver basic fire suppression and 911 dispatch for all kinds of emergencies um, they deliver police, they deliver, you know, in many places, although not many, you know, not all in my home state, certainly they deliver water supply, and they deliver sewage disposal and so forth. None of these things are protected by law, you know, what we're, what we're entitled to under our state constitutions and our state laws is typically just K to 12. Um, so we will we'll circle back to this and people will understand why it's so relevant. Um, but so so to Josephine County, this is uh, this is how you introduce Josephine County. Rural Josephine. Well, I, you start. I should acknowledge you start by talking about how beautiful Josephine County is. It's a beautiful area. But then you talk about the people. Um, rural Josephine County has long attracted people looking for more than fertile land. They wanted to escape things. Taxes, suburban materialism, child support debt, homophobia, arrest warrants, the urban cost of living day jobs, nuclear annihilation, clothing, California. Uh, I love that list of things people are trying to escape. And then later in the book, you talk about um, two seemingly irre irre irreconcilable groups of people that had made the township their home uh, in Josephine County, and they both hated law enforcement. Um, can you talk about the those two groups of people and the people who live in Josephine County and the sort of politics of that place? Yeah, I mean, this is part of why um, Josephine County became just so fascinating to me. I don't know if, if you and your listeners remember that Dos Equis ad of like the most interesting man <laughs> in the world. And often I felt like Josephine County was the most interesting county in the world. <laughs> yeah. I fell in love with all the places I reported, you know, so I had my moments with all of them. But Josephine is has such a fascinating history. And those two groups you describe locally are referred to as the hippies and the straight poor. Mm -hmm. And if you just start with the hippies for a minute, there's this fascinating backstory of Northern California and Southern Oregon communes, sort of lefty back to the land movements that were, um, that some of them have really important origins in LGBTQ rights and escaping homophobia. Um, some of them are, are Christian fundamentalists groups, some of them are, are just um, back to the land kind of self-reliance groups more broadly. And um, and so you get those on the left. You also get this off the grid um, uh, effort or, you know, this off the grid kind of searching for the soul of independence through the far right. So Josephine gets settled by various communes, although I doubt they would want to be called that, but like retreat centers and, and um, uh, communities that are um, that are part of the libertarian right, really trying to escape kind of the state and develop kind of alternative um, cultural understandings of what's going on in the country. So you get this, this sort of off the grid sort of aspect of Josephine's culture, but then what's referred to as the straight poor mm -hmm. is um, more a local way of describing folks that are part of the blue collar heritage of Josephine as a um, as a as a timber county, and that means not just logging jobs, but of course mill jobs, trucking jobs, and you know the sort of larger suite of jobs that are um are adjacent to or connected to the underlying timber harvests. Reagan, 
Yeah. So I think um, when I was thinking about that and kind of thinking through as you're giving that answer, we talk about the natural resource economy in Oregon quite a bit. Um, what is your kind of view of the origin story for you talked about um, the poor and the poverty that's there, but also the government being broke? And can you define those two things um, when you're talking about that, too? So I guess that's a separate question. So first question is, can you define the difference of poor versus broke? And then also talk about what was the origin story for that for Josephine County? Great. Yeah. So I'll give a kind of qu the quickest answer I can give. It's somewhat wonky, but forgive me. So the poor part in the book, I think I, I define as places that have two problems. So one problem is that they have at least one fifth of their people living under the poverty line, which for your listeners is so important to know how low that number is. That's yeah. about $26,000 a year for a family of four. Wow. So if you've got one in five of your people countywide who are living below that line or citywide, that means you've got a lot of constant, what sociologists called concentrated poverty. But then in addition, and Josephine no longer meets that line, by the way, part of the fight oh, to really? the town kind of arc of Josephine is that it has brought some of those numbers down. But at the time that I was reporting, um, it was struggling with that level of concentrated poverty. Then the second dimension of the poor part is, is that the median income across the county is um, less than, equal to or less than two thirds of the state median income. And what that signifies is that it's not a polarized tax base. Like I'm talking to you from San Francisco, we've got intense concentrated poverty here, terrible, epic, record-breaking concentrated poverty. We also have epic record-breaking wealth. Yeah. So across our tax base, we have this like high tail and this low tail. It's the middle that's squeezed out here. These places I'm writing about, they have a low um, median income. So across the county is sort of this, you know, it's a more working class kind of character. So that's on the poor side. The broke side has to be up to state law. States have different ways of thinking about insolvency and what they allow local governments to do and when they're considered broke. Um, uh, but in all, um, all of the places I've written about have been designated by their state processes through receiverships or state intervention or municipal bankruptcy as unable to pay their bills in a way that is a kind of urgent public policy problem that the state has to get involved with. So all of them have made some kind of state list based on the criteria that the state is most concerned about for being, um, you know, at risk of debt, long-term debt, but also deficits like, oh my God, we cannot pay our employees the next round of paychecks. Mm. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's the Reagan did that that answered the big picture question but you had a specific yep. Josephine part too. The second question was where was the origin story of Josephine County's poverty? Have they always been poor or did that start at a certain point and what kind of caused that and are there any factors that accelerated that problem? And then it seems like you kind of alluded to the fact that there's some recovery also. Great. Yes. So Josephine, I don't I don't want to say that Josephine has always been poor, but I think it's really important that the Oregon timber industry was not heavily unionized the way that a lot of Washington's timber industry was. So the truth is that Oregon's work products industry and a lot of the jobs connected to timber harvest were low income working class jobs for most of Oregon's history. So I think you know, it, this is one way in which Oregon and Washington are, you know, somewhat distinct. Um, and it's it's not anything, there's no choice that Oregon or Washington made. It's more an idiosyncratic result of kind of who the big companies were and the union mm -hmm. history of those companies. Anyway, so, um, but here along comes the, um, so one other thing is that timber harvest dated back to the 1920s in Oregon. Um, and almost right away, they were already in competition with global timber, especially South America, and then later Japan and Russia, um, these larger uh, regions of timber production. And so at some level, Oregon has always competed globally with other timber supplies, and that's been a source of ongoing stress. 
But in particular, the 1980s was a big wave and the late 70s, big wave of automation. All your listeners should look up what a feller buncher is because that's the most awesome word in the history of <laughs> blogging. I don't know, a feller buncher. But you get these inventions, these technological inventions that replace labor um, en masse. And timber went through a lot of labor loss to the point that between 1978 and 1990, um, everybody in the work products industry, sort of across the board, um, uh, there was a 22% cut in pay. And I think it's important to kind of identify that already they were hanging on in um, you know, low-income jobs, 22% cut of pay across industry. And then and I think it's so important, then the spotted owl fight shows up. So mm -hmm. then early 90s, you get federal environmental law, the listing of the northern spotted owl. And at that point, the mills crash, there's a larger sort of uh, very dramatic downsizing of um, of timber. So that sets off the jobs problem, but it also would have set off a fiscal problem for local governments that I can describe or not, you guys can tell me, but um, but local governments in Oregon have been dependent on harvest receipts for a long time under this deal that was cut with the federal government. And um, so when, this, when the 90s come and there's this massive downsizing of timber harvest, um, uh, there's a revenue problem and a jobs problem. The federal government patched that for mm -hmm. Oregon all the way till the Great Recession. So I think that's why the period I'm really writing about is this giant crash in revenues in the Great Recession. And that lags the spotted owl by, you know, I mean, the, the Northwest Forest Plan was 1993. So this is so much later. And um, so that's a really important part of this story. At some level, the timber counties were sort of living off of a political compromise that had taken place yeah. in the in the 90s and at one you know eventually the federal government like started to pull the plug on that subsidy line so um i want before we go into some specific topics i want to paint a picture of what the scenario you just described in terms of declining revenue actually meant for people who lived in josephine county because i think you know i've spent all of my life living in the suburbs and um, i think people who who come from the type of place where I grew up, um, it is actually unimaginable to think of paying an admission fee to go to a local park or to subscribe to a fire department through a subscription service that's unregulated uh, if you wanted to have your home um, uh, protected in the case of a fire or to call 911 and for have them to literally tell you we have no one within hundreds of miles and there's nothing we can do, but you should ask the person outside to go away for example. So I, I, I was wondering, I just would like you to speak to that a little bit. Like what, what did the decline in government revenue actually, how did it show up for people living in Josephine County? How did it impact their lives? Yeah. Um, I want to start Ben by just acknowledging that there are rural counties all across the country that have unrecognizably low levels of government, you know, mm -hmm. incredibly weak thin public provision that just as you captured would be really shocking to people who've enjoyed a sort of urban portfolio of services. So I think it's not just Josephine, this is a really common problem. And in conversations over the years of reporting this book and my rural students and so forth, um, you know, you can find versions of this book all over the South. You can find versions of this all over Kentucky. There's just, you know, this problem is um, very common. But in the, Josephine is more extreme because as these subsidies from the federal government over the spot out compromise were pulled back, there was a, a really dramatic um, cut, a wave of cuts kind of all at once. And they um, really in the 2012 to 2016 period, and they described, um, or they included, as you described, um, shutting the entire county library and eventually privatizing it to a nonprofit, charging fees at former, you know, open space and parks, um, the closure of a wing of the county jail, 
Um, and uh, and then most dramatically, it the downsizing of the sheriff's department's hours, which 911 never shut, but as a practical matter, just as you described, if you call 911 and there's nobody there for the dispatcher to send, then they call the Oregon State Police and they try to get somebody coming in from, um, you know, Oregon State Police. And these are like real people that have real mileage in between where the caller is and where they are in the world. And so 911 may not have anybody available to send. So you get this, that's the sort of emergency part of it is that if 911 needs to dispatch and the sheriff's office is closed on weekends and evenings, then you're much less likely to get help. But even in non-emergency services, there's a whole category of things people need from a sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. right? If your house gets burglarized or your car gets stolen, if you want to file insurance, you need somebody to validate that that happened, right? My car's gone, right? So there's paperwork stuff you need from the government. There's record keeping. As the opioid crisis has raged across the West, sheriff's departments have been, you know, important for medical examiners and other kinds of cause of death, data keeping. I mean, how do you know how many people die of an opioid death if you don't have enough medical examiners mm -hmm. who are trained to do it? This is not in Josephine, but elsewhere, you know, arson is a really interesting part of this. You know, you can't just magically tell the difference between a house fire and arson of a house, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a person who's trained to do that and probably has a certification that validates their training to do that. And um, in a lot of the places I worked across the Rust Belt, they just had to cut all the people who had that kind of training. And so you stop reporting arsons. Does that mean that arson stopped being an issue? No. In fact, arson flares when there's no, you know, structure to control it. Um, so anyway, it's just to say that a lot of these invisible functions of government, we kind of take for granted until they're not there anymore. And Josephine had such a big concentrated wave of those cuts that even on you know, this is the Josephine chapter is really a story of sort of the law and order conservative majority in the city, in the county, kind of um, in intention with or sort of fighting for the future of Josephine with a more purist libertarian vision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the left has no political kind of um, grip on Josephine's politics. And so it's really about that kind of, is there a vision of the state as kind of um, a law and order backbone of this place? Or are we actually you know, completely off the grid. Well, now you were talking about their their challenges with, uh, you know, patrol and public safety. And I was just reading today, this is from the Jefferson Public Radio, the Josephine County Board of Commissioners are hosting three forums. They did this in July because their sheriff's office currently operating on a deficit, 1.5 million and mm -hmm. fiscal year 23, 24, they say this is where the rubber meets the road. We will not have any monies to fund that. So our patrol division would in essence be gone and they would be running a $6 million deficit and they don't have, I mean, there is a $6 million sitting around somewhere that they could just move to do this. And so it's going to, you know, create a lot of challenges for them. And we'll talk about some of those challenges here um, shortly, I think. Yeah. And Reagan, just a quick note, that's so important that, you know, the way Oregon law is organized, even if you pass a local levy to support things like sheriff's patrols, you have to reauthorize those every few years. So that's the problem is that voters are like, didn't we give you money last time? <laughs> but under state law, you have to keep going back to them and keep getting their permission. And I think it, 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 um, it nurtures this suspicion that there are hidden pots of money that like mm -hmm. you're just pissing the money away on, you know, excess spending of some kind. Um, well, you, you write yeah. about like, there's a lot of people who like embrace these conspiracy theories in, in Josephine County, but there's like, there's like seven or eight different common responses you had to people when they were campaigning for the public safety levies. And like, they were like, uh, you know, the sheriff is, you know, doing this as a stunt, he didn't need to cut back the hours that much. They're not spending the money effectively. There's extra money. Like people just don't believe that it could possibly be this bad. And I think driven in part by like what you're talking about. Yeah. And Ben, I want to push back and say, I don't think they're conspiracy theories. Like a lot mm -hmm. of them have historic 
roots. Like there's something that happened that people never got a sufficient answer that, you know, it had been resolved, that it wouldn't happen again, that somebody was sorry for it. I mean, so it's, they're not, they're not, I mean, there's a few people who would just always hate government just temperamentally or whatever. Sure. I think the the vast majority of voters are, you know, really thoughtful and they don't and, you know, they don't have perfect information all the time. And so part of what I describe is like if you've got to run a grassroots pro tax campaign in a super anti-government area, you are going to have to face the real skepticism that mm-hmm. people have about government. And it's interesting because, you know, in Josephine, that skepticism is on the far left over drug policy, too. So there's like yep. Yep. a sort of anti-government, you know, sense, you know, across the political spectrum. And yeah, I mean, it's it's funny that <laughs> there's an exact paragraph you're referring to. And as for me, as a person, I live in San Francisco, like saturated in kind of lefty politics. It's so important for the left to like face the mm. real concerns about government. I mean, I've got that page right in front of me. I wanted it on this podcast, right? Yeah. Self-dealing, heroic alternatives, right? This yep. idea that like you could have done something more clever, more innovative or whatever to what you were doing bad priorities, like you're just spending money on the wrong thing, empire building, you know, this is the story of public sector unions, or, you know, suspicion that departments are just, you know, taking over things for the sake of their own employees' interests, self-indulgence, um, and then the biggest one of all, a perception that government staff are lazy, dishonest, or incompetent, and that stuff runs really deep, and it is not just in Josephine, and so I think what's brilliant about the campaign that I describe is that the sheriff, Sheriff Dave Daniel and Kate Dwyer and a bunch of other residents and leaders in Josephine, they really built communication systems so that the public could stand up and ask about that stuff. You know, really ask about like, what are the moments of governmental abuse that they need like a public airing about? And the sheriff could you know, build credibility, you know, demonstrate his knowledge, demonstrate his integrity as a public servant. And, you know, and kind of apologize sometimes for the, mm-hmm. you know, the mismanagement that um, that preceded him. Um, so anyway, I think it's partly it's that communication line that, as you know very well from the school board, like it's hard to find ways to talk to voters. Yeah. And but the only way you're going to get across this rot in our relationship to government is to allow people to talk it through. That's my opinion anyway. No, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the pushback because you're right. Conspiracy is not the right word. I do think it's fair to say a lot of those fears, at least in the case of Josephine County that is being painted, they're not true. They're not accurate, but they're based on past experience or observed failures. Um, So I think that that's really helpful reframing. There were two, we're kind of jumping around our show outline here, but this is an interesting conversation. So we're just going to roll with it. Um, There were two like kind of epiphany moments for me in the book. And this, what we're talking about right now is one of them. Um, You this is, I'm gonna, this is a quote from, from the book. The lesson from the su- successful tax campaigns was that the need is not enough. Urgency is not enough. You've got to actually prove that government can help. You have to convince a critical mass of skeptical voters one at a time that government is competent, accountable, and necessary. Uh, and that was an epiphany for me because like, I think for me, at least the initial thinking would be like, just tell everyone how bad it is. It's crazy that 911 puts you on a waiting period, like go tell that story. But they tried that like seven or eight or nine times. And the voters consistently said that wasn't enough. But finally, they turned the corner and not just one or two, but I think it was four levies in a single election passed and just by narrow margin. It wasn't (laughs) it wasn't a mandate, but it was enough. Um, So before we kind of jump back around, can you talk a little bit about um, what you think, you know, elected officials, government actors can learn from the successful um, levies in Josephine County in 2017? Yeah, I'd love to. I mean, Reagan, I hope you agreed with that, like, need is not enough. You have to convince people the government can help because, you know, I think that's something that lefties tend to take for granted. There, I, I've come to believe that a, a deep, deep, 
um, separation in our underlying political life is simply whether people have had good or bad experiences with government, whether they sort of instinctually trust or mistrust the state. And I think, you know, there's a lot of division and polarization that I think we could kind of um, talk about more freely if we like laid that on the table and actually looked at what people's experiences with government have been. And it's interesting in places with really weak government, like, you know, rural areas and and uh, the kinds of chronically poor urban areas that I write about, people have a lot of experience of government just not having their back. Mm -hmm. Just like when I need, I don't get anything from you. And when I really needed you, like crickets, Mm -hmm. And that sense of kind of abandonment, um, you know, builds up in people as a kind of, um, you know, uh, low expectations of the state, but also, you know, sort of hope that you can build alternative systems. Um, so I saw that all over the country. And again, in different racial and political compositions, like that's not a white rural problem and that's not a conservative problem. I mean, the lowest levels of trust I saw in government were in Detroit. Mm. So you, but so that's one thing. Um, but then also I want to just frame that at the state level too, because I think that's a big part of what goes on at the state level is that we only tell these terrible stories of need like the story for the timber counties has been like look how desperate they are yeah. you know, oh my god no libraries like this is such a you know terrible time and the truth is that that alone is not going to motivate appropriations mm -hmm. in competitive state budgeting mm -hmm. because you know people have to be people at the state level have to be convinced that if they deliver that money down toward that need it's going to be spent well by people who really know how to solve these problems and i think that's you know so that's part of the story i tell in this book is like if all we do is is write and tell save us we're dying stories and all of our narratives are about poverty and and despair and and dying and so forth then we we can't actually motivate people to participate in the solutions and to really reach out for the kind of partnerships you need when government can't solve all of its problems with money mm -hmm. um that's so, perfect yeah, I think that's so important sorry because that leads right into my next question basically so um you talked about people actually believe in the government can solve the problems, right? And Oregon has struggled a lot on that recently. I think for a long time, uh, and this is when I was starting to get into politics in the early, in the era of like early 2010s, we had this kind of view that Oregon government was pretty competent. There wasn't a lot of corruption. And then it just felt like there was a wave of corruption and incompetence that started and hasn't really stopped. And whether it's true or not, right, it doesn't take very many of those stories to give people that idea that government isn't functional anymore or that it struggles to deliver on promises. And we passed two years ago, Measure 110, and um, this is gonna be a really, uh, really limited um, <clears throat> explanation, but basically it, de it decriminalized um, possession of small amounts of hard drugs. So you're not dealing it, the idea is you you're just a user. And so what we wanted to do was we also took marijuana tax revenue and directed it to treatment. And what was found in about a year and a half in the Secretary of State did an audit of this program. It was supposed to move about $300 million into drug treatment and 136 people went into drug treatment programs, right? And so it was it, it there were some early warning things that happened that they were able to help them with. But the actual number of people in treatment was just excruciatingly low. And it's led to this kind of idea that we we decriminalize drugs and but it hasn't helped at all because the the back end that we've put in there. Um, is it doesn't seem to be functional, either the money isn't flowing fast enough or it's not getting to the right places or the people who it can reach aren't being reached. So your book kind of discusses how drugs are such a big problem in Oregon. We're a very high drug use um, state. And we're kind of curious on what your general thoughts might be, even if you're not familiar with 110, um, on how that drug policy is gonna impact or did impact Josephine County, other counties like Josephine County. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I want to come back. Let me come back to 110, Reagan, but I want to just respond to the first part of what you said, which is so important, this kind of, um, this, you know, uh, when there, these big news events happen, you know, whether it's just rank corruption where somebody gets, you know, walked off in handcuffs or it's just waste or it's, you know, slow money that kind of enters the bureaucracy and like can't get back out or whatever the sort of event is. If our conversation about local politics is always those moments, mm-hmm. um, I think we end up, you have to do that. You guys have done such amazing coverage on this podcast of, of investigative local investigative reporting and how important it is to have local news coverage and kind of, you know, eyes on the hen house. So I, I don't want to take anything away from that kind of anti-corruption, anti-mismanagement mission, journalism, and just, you know, public accountability, incredibly important. But we can't have stories of of communities, of counties that are only about that. Mm -hmm. And I think um, in one of your podcasts, um, Les uh, Zates, right? Yep, yep. That was an awesome podcast. But it's so interesting to hear him describe, you know, it can't, it can't, he, you know, does a lot of that corruption um, work. But, you know, it also can't be just like, we occasionally send in somebody, I think he said the mosquito festival, like some corny, <laughs> yeah. like cute little local color thing or whatever. There has to be a broader, a broader way to have conversations about how government works and the things it does badly, the things it does well, and the things it just does, period. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if we're just wearing blindfolds all the time, we will never um, be able to hold it to account properly. So that's like the big picture thing I want to say. Meanwhile, I have no, I've, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I'm careful about like postulating about laws I don't know. And measure 110, I don't know carefully. So I don't want to sort of venture into that story. Um, But it's so interesting to me to see the kind of innovation that was going on in Josephine over drug courts and Really, the Josephine went through this period of experimentation, you know, under emergency circumstances, like not really by choice in a way, but it went through this period of experimentation about um, ways to develop detox facilities that are not the jail, ways to develop diversion programs that are not the jail, that are not the most expensive kind of public um, uh, portal, um, ways to uh, reroute funds for mental health to nonprofits and so forth. So, you know, Josephine went through this kind of experimentation. Um, and as Oregon moves to, you know, into these drastic public experience experiments in decriminalization, I think it could actually learn a lot from the timber counties and really learn from some of the mistakes that were made and, you know, and some of the, um, the successes. Um, So, you know, that's sort of one general thing. A second just general comment is that also because the timber counties and including Josephine went through these periods where they had all these laws on the books that were not being enforced, they saw the consequences of really uneven kind of discretionary enforcement where you know, something might be illegal, but, you know, if there's nobody at the sheriff's office or if they can't actually, if there's no beds at the jail, there's no backup for an arrest. And so having gone through all of that, Josephine also saw some of the challenges to that, you know, that unfettered discretion and just super uneven enforcement and what happens to citizen kind of obedience to the rule of law when there isn't a state backing it up. And the bottom line I would say from that is that it does suggest that if you're not going to have a system to enforce laws, you know, you do have to think about actually owning the decriminalization of underlying offenses um, so that the system is fair and transparent and that actually like the behavior of the state lines up with the behavior of the written law. Um, So it's just one, you know, larger kind of observation, but I have no opinion about that larger decriminalization of hard drugs or how it was executed in, in Oregon. So um, that actually is a good transition to like what actually happens when uh, there isn't sufficient law enforcement officers to enforce the law. And this is where I'm going to I'm going to confess 
how wrong I was um, about my perception of what was happening in Josephine County. So there was there was some, and I don't know. There's probably laziness on my part as a consumer, but I also am now wondering if there was reporting that made me believe this that I read that maybe didn't capture the full picture in the way that your book did. Um, but you talk about North Valley Community Watch and Cave Junction Patrol as two examples of like law enforcement goes away. I mean, the sheriff's office just was gutted. Like everybody gets laid off basically. There's no capacity to respond. Um, and there's certainly no capacity to do sort of like preemptive policing, like, you know, protecting storefronts and those kinds of things. And so these communities banded together. Um, sometimes it's retired law enforcement. Sometimes it's volunteers. Like one of the guys says it's, you know, 50 and 60 year old women who are the, you know, the key people who are you know leading these patrols. In my perception, and I'm guessing the perception of a lot of folks on the left was like, what a disaster. You've got these vigilante patrols creating their own laws, enforcing them, them in their own ways. And it was actually like this very scary picture of lawlessness. But the way that you, fr and it sounds like there actually are some of those. Uh, you alluded to like a couple examples that are not at all like North Valley Community Watch or CJ Patrol. Um, but these these folks are like, they're also replacing social services. They're showing up with like soup when it's cold at night. They uh, like, there's this one, I was literally like tearing up reading about this. This woman who, I don't know if it was a mental health thing or an addiction thing, but she like is so frustrated and she punches through a piece of glass and is, her arm is just soaked with blood. And the next morning she has nowhere to go. There's no social service agency. There's no law enforcement she can go to. So she goes to the head of the local patrol. I think his name's Jimmy Evans. Um, and Jimmy's the guy who helps help, who helps her, who, who helps her. Um, so I, I, I just, what I've struggled with though is, trying to hold two contradictory thoughts in my head at one time one is which like we should not have private groups of citizens responding to crime that's not the appropriate role and on the other hand like there's no doubt about it that these groups at least while they were in existence were contributing a dramatic need uh, a dramatic good to a community who desperately needed it um so i'm kind of curious how you reflected on that tension of like it really shouldn't be their jobs, but thank God for them. They probably, they definitely save lives. Um, so yeah, interested on, you know, what you thought as you were learning about these stories. Yeah. I, um, I, so first of all, I'll say that there, you can find examples like this nationwide. I interviewed people who do, um, 911 volunteer work in Flint, you know, they staff the 911 dispatch things. I interviewed women who do group patrols or take turns on a very formal schedule to do nighttime patrols in Detroit. Um, there are very elaborate, very formal neighborhood watch systems and neighborhood patrol systems in the city of Vallejo. You can find, um, and those are just the places I've seen personally, but you can find this kind of um, substitute uh, emergency services or substitute law enforcement in a lot of different environments. Again, across the political spectrum, like mm -hmm. this is not a sort of right wing thing. Number two is that just as you alluded to, there is there has been reporting, especially by the LA Times, that was one that hurt people in Josephine sort of more personally, um, uh, reporting that kind of immediately jumps to the idea that these are vigilantes. Mm -hmm. And there's a real sense like we're we're really sticking our necks out to protect our neighbors and then we you know get like kind of ridiculed as being yeah. these kind of lawless armed um vigilantes and um and so i think that's you know i because i was there and doing interviews and really came to deeply admire a person like Jimmy Evans. I mean, not every county has a Jimmy Evans, yeah. but I mean, a very, very special kind of Dorothea, Dorothy Day um, kind of figure for the community of just rooted in Catholic commitment to, um, to service and to mercy work. And so not everybody has people like Jimmy Evans. Um, uh, but Anyway, what what I what I observed in Josephine is that you know once you have volunteers trying to figure out how to substitute for law enforcement, they're going to do it in different kinds of ways. So you get 
a kind of dispatch model in which people share their cell phones. Retired police officers share their cell phones in private networks and they dispatch on emergencies. You're going to get a patrol function of like regular, we're out all the time at night, we keep an eye on things, a deterrence function. Um, and then, you know, various hybrids of those two. Um, and, uh, you know, and they're going to run a lot of the same challenges. They're going to face a lot of the same challenges, but maybe more so as law enforcement. So they've got, you know, a lot of different personalities in the group. And, you know, these groups, the two groups you described, both really were super careful with selection so that they didn't end up with what they kept calling hotheads. You know, the yeah. rapid escalation, the people who are there to sort of zip tie people and not there to sort of protect the community. So they had to do a lot of kind of selection and training and really, you know, supporting people in the skills of de-escalation so that, as Jimmy put it beautifully and really tenderly one time, he's like, my daughter lives here. Like, I don't want bullets flying all over this town. You know, we've got to sort of do this in a way that is really, um, careful. And of course, there are real risks to them. I mean, yeah. you know, they go around um, and uh, challenge people in the middle of the night or break up bar fights or go into, you know, they try to avoid domestic disputes, but sometimes there's something really terrible happening in a home. And all of those are, um, you know, high risk settings where people might not have the training. So those are real challenges. And I did not I really tried to stay in balance of sort of acknowledging um, the way that I think these systems were understood by their participants as a form of mutual aid of like, we have got to protect each other when we can't rely on, you know, the state to do it for us and wanted to, you know, acknowledge that. And then on the other hand, to really hear them for the challenges. Um, and unlike professional law enforcement, um, you know, people are not getting paid. And so the truth is they burn out really quickly. They're doing this on top of their normal job. So the turnover is terrible. Yeah. And so in a way, I think what you see in Josephine is this burst of intense commitment in these groups sort of right in the heart of the cuts. And it kind of tapers over time because, you know, a community can't sustain that on top of their normal jobs. Um, so yeah, so I think there were there were real challenges, um, and uh, you know, and I had to be super careful about it. Real quick before I go to Reagan on a new topic, um, is the lesson is the lesson from observing those groups like push back on this? But like one of my takeaways is like they are that is exactly why we have to have locally funded law enforcement because despite heroic efforts i mean you talk about the, they'll have people join that drop out after a month or two months that jimmy's doing the same training every week to these new people who who don't stick with it and then i think eventually they go away or one of the two um stopped existing essentially although they still feel calls on their personal cell phones to respond but like isn't the takeaway here that Basically, despite heroic local efforts, local efforts, you can't replace the need for local government functions. You know, I don't want a generic takeaway about um, about the need for police to always do these functions. I don't think mm -hmm. that's what you're saying, but I want to yeah, kind of yeah. you know assert it firmly on my part. The thing that's going on in Josephine that I think was so dramatic is that. As they were downsizing law enforcement so rapidly, all these other services for mental health, for intervention, for drug rehab had also been, you know, plummeting and just gutted. And so really, and this is something I saw in all my communities, I mean, police tend to be, you know, schools have their protected lines of funding, so they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. but again, separating out K to 12, everything else you know, police and fire are kind of the last to go for the yeah. most part. So by the time you get to really deep, you know, 30, 40, 50% cuts in law enforcement or two thirds in Josephine's case, like I was writing about, you've already just slashed the budget on all kinds of other things for children and families and drugs. And so that's the real problem here is that police were kind of the last thing in between kind of citizens and some of these, you know, terrible challenges of, of poverty. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, the, 
the whole principle of divest, you know, that comes from the left has is actually has a lot in common with some of the rhetoric in Josephine from the right, which is like, we don't actually need the government to do all of this. We don't need armed police officers paid handsomely compared to other public employees to do all of this. We need them to do some of this stuff. And so what do we need them to do? And I think they, you know, in Josephine, it is a chilling, for me, a very personal, very chilling expression of how we in that environment so recording the political will and preferences of the people there having basically no police was a terrible answer Mm -hmm. you know whether they need like the police for everything is not the conclusion and and i think again josephine because it was forced down this road by budget it it did end up you know, trying to nurture a a vision of citizen facing policing that really would kind of deliver on what people wanted from law enforcement, what was sort of most urgent and important about law enforcement, and really tried to kind of rebuild the best version of rural policing. And I think Dave Daniel has been an amazing sheriff for that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then also use these drug courts and these other domestic violence intervention systems and other things that, you know, need to be there traveling alongside, you know, armed police. Um, Yeah, so that's what I would say. In that sense, Josephine, like, is a hard story if you just want to have a fight about, like, 100% police, 0% police. Yeah. Josephine will not serve any of the polarized like um, pieces of that debate. Um, but in in that sense, um, and in, and I would just say the bottom line is that it's not for me to say how much police Josephine has. Like partly I'm just trying to say local people should should be involved in shaping the nature of the state that they want. So Michelle, I want to wrap up our conversation with a question about um, leadership local, and then I'll let Ben tackle the state level. So the question about local leadership is kind of built on an observation that I have being around local Republican Party. So I've lived all over the state. Um, I've lived in the Valley. I've spent some time in Central Oregon. I spent some time in Southern Oregon. The only place I haven't spent a ton of time is Eastern Oregon, but I've talked to and know a lot of people who live there. And my sense is that, especially in the conservative communities, there's kind of two views of government. There's this general suspicion of government And then there's the Republicans who are in government. And both of those two groups on the conservative spectrum kind of clash a lot because the the ones who distrust government kind of think that the Republicans in government are just there to enrich themselves and their friends, and they're not there to help the broader community. And the Republicans in government kind of look at the conservatives who distrust government and say it's just an ideological thing. They don't understand how difficult it is, how functional government Uh, when it's not there, would be a real problem for them. So my question is, when you have that kind of trouble, and and Josephine County is kind of a good example of this, where do you get the kind of people that you need to hold local office that are going to have the kind of wherewithal to cut through that, make the the pitch to voters about why government services and uh, some government services are necessary and do impact their lives, and to get those things passed And then also, not even just on the elected front, but the public officials who are hired to do this work and do it effectively, because it's one thing to convince voters to get something passed. It's another thing to hire the people who are actually going to get it accomplished in a way that fulfills voters' expectations. So how do they go about and how are these communities going to go about finding and getting the right people in these positions to get them back on their feet, I guess? Hmm. Reagan, I think that question is so important. I hope your listeners like really internalize the description that you gave, because I think, again, there's this tendency on in a really polarized conversation to just paint the right with like one brush and that differentiation mm-hmm. you described of sort of suspicion, sort of more purist libertarian impulses as against this kind of law and order vision of a different kind of government. And, you know, th- it's really important for people to understand kind of those, the spectrum sort of within the ideological run of things. Um uh, but then I feel like the, your ultimate question is like the million dollar question, right, of who would run for office? Like we could ask that in so many different settings. And um, 
And I think about this all the time as a teacher with millennial and Gen Z students who, mm. you know, tend those generations, um, you know, apologies <laughs> for the world that you're inheriting. And, you know, and you guys have just such a load on your shoulders and like more than any other generations, like we need you to step in to turn out in elections, to step into local office, state office, federal, you know, across the political spectrum. Like we need that. And so how do we call people into this work. And one thing I've observed in, you know, in the kinds of low income areas that I write about is that when we only tell these terrible stories about places, nobody wants to run for office. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like if this place is, you know, a total hellhole run by a bunch of crooks, and it's dangerous, and the problems are intractable, and so forth, like, that's a scary job. You know, you're just kind of signing yourself up as a sort of um, almost like a hospice nurse or something. Like this <laughs> place is in crisis and I'm here at the end or something. Yeah. And, um, and so you can't, you know, I think leadership really turn out, but also people standing for office like really suffers if those are the only stories that we tell. And this is why I think your podcast is so important. Like people need more nuanced experiences, knowledge, you know, observations about how government works, and they need to, you know, um, give government some credit sometimes so that on the right and the left, people will, um, will stand for office. Um, so, you know, that's part of what I think is so amazing about the 2017 levies that passed in Josephine, just this moment that I kept thinking about that morning when or it was the night, but then the next morning, all the officials and journalists called, but they get the election returns. They learn that they've finally broken this logjam and they've finally gotten these levies through and they'll sort of limp forward with a new generation of funding. And, um, and I just think about how important it was for that moment to really get celebrated kind of locally statewide like really understand like where did that breakthrough come from like who built it in the library they made 14,000 phone calls to <laughs> turn their library back public like the mm -hmm. New York Times just swarmed Josephine for like teach us how democracy is done <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's like that that thing that makes me feel patriotic yeah you know I am a law professor like we want to believe that people can change government, that they can become government. And, you know, Josephine produced one of those really beautiful stories of people kind of sitting with a period of, of contraction and then really working together. I mean, the library's campaign to save itself was just funny and creative and silly sometimes. And you just imagine people having you know, working together and really feeling a sense of community around that campaign. And so when they win, like that's a that's a really big moment. And the next morning when the state officials call and like pat Josephine on the back, yeah. that's a moment when the state kind of says like, good, you know, you do your part, we're going to do our part. We sort of move together in the next phase of time. So we have to, we have to look at those wins and, um, and yeah, ironically, you know, some of the most kind of in, in the end, and my experience of reporting on Josephine is that here's this place that on the surface is very anti-government. And yet the democratic process to pass those levies is one of the most magnificent expressions of democratic activity and democratic faith that you could have. And, you know, so the left has a lot to learn from that kind of uh, effort so um that is a, a good transition to our final question um obviously reagan and i don't neither of us live in josephine county um i'm in the portland metro area reagan is a little further south in the valley but not to josephine county um given everything you learned about josephine county but oregon more broadly and our tax system i mean you talk in the book about our history of initiative petitions and what that's done to the sort of framework of uh revenue generation what what would your what do you think we should be thinking about? What should state level actors be thinking about if their goal? I think we all it's hard not to root for Josephine County and to want um, to want 
want more for that community and for the people like one of the things I love about your book is that there's a lot of vignettes with personal stories and characters who are real people um, that we, we didn't really talk about in our conversation, but that kind of put um, color to the the picture you're painting. Um, so what what should the state be doing to support or make things a little bit easier for the leaders in, in not just government leaders, but the leaders in the county who are trying to find a better way for the folks who live there? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, I think, first of all, the, um, you know, state decision makers, and I don't, this will sound paternalistic, I don't mean to be like, assuming that they're not already doing this, or kind of, you know, telling them how to do their job. But I, I do get the impression that in places like Josephine, that really are, you know, good five to six hours away from Portland, mm -hmm. um, you know, that uh, there is a sense that people don't, um, you know, people judge it without actually spending time there and really getting to know the local politics. And I do think part of the urban and rural divide that you guys sit with on this podcast and really care about comes from people just not having a lot of experiences kind of across that line. So Reagan, when you describe like living in a lot of different parts of Oregon, like I think there's probably a lot of decision makers who haven't done that, you know, mm -hmm. on whether they now live in an urban area or they now live in a rural area. And so I think at some level, state government does have to become sort of, um, uh, you know, get as much kind of uh, develop relationships kind of on the ground in the counties that are farther away from the Willamette Valley, because that, you know, those relationships are how you get stuff done. At the end of the book, I describe how there are so many moments in reporting this where I thought like I could call this entire book trust and relationships. And that would be such a terrible book title and nobody <laughs> it's like a marriage advice book. But, um, but it really is a, like, I did 250 interviews with this book. People came back to that theme over and over and over again. It's like, that's the thing that's broken. And that's true at the state local level too. Like mm -hmm. those, the, the relationships are weak, the social networks are weak, the trust across those lines of state looking at local, local looking at state is super weak. And, you know, at some level, people have to repair that by kind of getting to know each other and like, yeah each other's cell phone numbers and having dinner together and like figuring out kind of what their common ground is. So I think that's, you know, that's one piece of it. Um, uh, and, um, and then I think, you know, it also involves um, just this larger uh, recognition of, of the progress that is being sort of fought out and won on the ground. And again, as we've talked about, you know, celebrating that progress to me is not just about, um, you know, a feel good story. It is actually the basis of political will because mm. the state, if the state doesn't see progress, um, it will, um, it will give up on the place just as people have to recover that sense of possibility and hope locally too. I mean, that's something that I wrote about so much in the book also, like people, these vicious cycles in part happen because people give up on their community. They're just dying to get out of there. And for as long as they live there, they are, um, you know, just kind of gritting it out. And you have to, at some level, kind of turn toward a more virtuous cycle of friendships and joint cooperation and so forth, in which people start kind of booking games, you know, setting goals, delivering on those goals, feeling, having relationships around that work and, um, you know, feeling a sense of possibility and, and hope. Um, Michelle, you make a really good point. Um, and then I'll let Ben close unless I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no. you, I think your point about the relationships was super, was super great because I read an anecdote today while I was reading some um, political news that um, Governor Ted Kulingowski of Oregon, who served from about like 2002 to 2010, basically, he tried to get to know legislators in the building that he didn't know by going bowling with them, which I think is a really fun um, anecdote. But you're right, because if it's not built on relationships and mutual trust, it will feel like the state coming in and telling Josephine County what to do. And it's not going to work, especially in when you have a dichotomy currently where you have a very blue um, a very blue state government that's controlled, you know, primarily by Democrats and a lot by, you know, Democrats in the Portland Salem area. And then they're going to come in and tell Josephine County they're going to, you know, 
and that's why I appreciate Ben because it's like here on this podcast, we get to discuss things and he, he gets to think about and, and ask questions about different points of view and the same with me. So it's not, it's not the, you know, conservative rabble rousers come in and overturning Salem to really fix government for Oregonians. And it's not the people from Portland coming in telling the rednecks how to live um like real like real Oregonians and so I think that like you know the trust and relationship piece if it's not there all of this is going to break down it doesn't matter how committed you are if you don't have other people to be committed with even if it's not that many people right you don't need that many people really to make a huge amount of change but you do need some committed people who have that shared trust and it's going to be at some point it's going to have to be bipartisan and it's going to have to reach across regions and 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 um, belief systems. Yeah, I, Reagan, I think that's so true. I just, that is one of the things that was so moving to me about Josephine. And, um, I, I really, everything you said really resonates with me. And I think what I saw in Josephine's relationship to the state is these stories that in the absence of real relationships where people actually know each other and they have a sense of what's actually going on in a more nuanced political way, people resort to these you know, narratives that kind of float around, um, you know, and I think the, the, there's a weird narrative that, that gets assigned to Josephine all the time from, it's a weird, like, right and left hybrid, which is like, they're not helping themselves. Yeah. Right. Like they need yep. to, you know, we've been bailing them out for a long time. Federal government's been shoveling money towards the timber counties and they're not doing their part or they're not helping themselves. And and it it actually is really similar to the undeserving poor rhetoric that we use about individuals yeah. who use, you know, food stamps and so forth. It's actually really deep. And local people internalize that like they start to think about that themselves, not only in Josephine, but all the places I was reporting you know, public officials right and left constantly think like, I don't want to keep having my hands out to the state. And they right. I, they describe themselves as like beggars of the state. And that story that, you know, we tell of like, you know, they can't survive or whatever, it makes all these dynamics harder because instead of looking around and kind of inventorying like what are the assets in this place like how do we build on next generation progress who are the people who lead this community the ones who really care and work hard um you know what are the organizations that have the greatest credibility and integrity you know you build from assets you don't build from you know shaming people <laughs> And so I think anyway, so yeah, in the absence of real trust and relationships, like we have a lot of stories about politics that will like rush in and take the place of all that. That I I think is a great place to close. And I will just, that is, I know that that is the narrative that a lot of legislators in Salem had, uh, at least in the time when I was working in the legislature, it was pre-2017. Um, so maybe that shifted. I hope it's shifted, but um, your book really helps uh craft i i don't even think craft you're capturing a counter narrative that exists down there that people are leading on um and helps people like me and i hope others in oregon see um a more complicated story of josephine county and i can't resist i'm so sorry but let me just no, no, no. one like detail around that that i just feel like in my yeah. teacher mode like i want your legislator audience to hear um, but, you know, we, we talk all the time about levies that fail, right? And But under Oregon law, you know, fail could mean that 45% of the people voted for it yeah, and 55% didn't, right? And so when you shame the county for the 55%'s vote, like, remember the 45 that turned out to that election and lost. And I think it's all about like, is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? I mean, yeah. at some level, you have to kind of understand that Oregon law has locked people into these um, into these races where they have to prove these tiny increments of taxes, you know, every time. And the fact that Oregon has locked itself into this straitjacket from, you know, set on the distribution of property taxes from 1997. I mean, you guys weren't even born then, I bet. I mean, that's like ancient history from the point of the state. Just, just barely. Been... I would have been two at that point. <laughs> okay. Well, you look, yeah, you're young and, and vital, Reagan. Um, <laughs> but so, I mean, I just think it's so important. Like 
this is a longer discussion, but you know, other states are doing that now on fracking. And I feel like Ohio and others like learn from Oregon, like do not hit yeah. your constitutional wagon to the um, infinite supply of a natural resource, which is what the 1997 lock-in really did. Um, anyway, so yeah, so there's structural problems and, um, you know, and you have to sort of remember that each of these elections are kind of bound to that straitjacket. Totally. That we could go on forever because there's so many things <laughs> I want. Like, I want to talk about, too, how, you know, a, a common thread here, um, whether it be local or state level, is a lot of these decisions were made by voters. Voters, the majority of the people got to make decisions. But the question is, were they making decisions with all the information? Was it good information? Um, you know, who turned out to vote? Was it really representative of the who people? fund the campaign for the yeah. statewide measure? <laughs> totally. Yes, exactly. So anyway, and that's ben, this is podcast. why democracy, direct democracy is bad when you do it, but great <laughs> when we do it and vice versa. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that is that captures it. Um, well, Michelle, you don't have to hawk your book because we will hawk your book for you. <laughs> the book is The Fight to Save the Town. Um, I can't recommend it enough. And we really, we literally talked about like a quarter of the book. Um, <laughs> there's three, there's three other um, places. We didn't ask about Michael Tubbs. I want to ask about Michael Tubbs, but we'll save that for another time too. But really incredible book, beautifully written. Um, and it's not just, it's not like a, an economics book. It's a book about people and it's a book about places and stories. Um, so Michelle, if people want to learn more about you uh, or your work, your writing, where's the best place for them to go? Oh, well, I'm on the Stanford Law School website, but I'm not important. What people should do is learn about River Stars, Performing Arts in Josephine <laughs> County, or the Four-Way Community Foundation, yep. that a lot of amazing work in Josephine and Jackson County, um, or the Illinois Valley Community Development Organization. Those are three orgs. I was ready for that then. <laughs> That was awesome. I will li I will link to them if I can find links. I'll put them in the in the bio of the episode so people can check them out and hopefully toss a few dollars their way too. Awesome. That's the goal. Cool. Well, Michelle, thank you again for coming on the podcast. This was super fun. Uh, we could have gone for two more hours, uh, but hopefully we'll have you back sometime soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Reagan and Ben. That was a terrific conversation. I loved it.